All right, let's get into it this morning. We're in a series on Romans. And as we, as we set up this morning's message, we're going to talk about struggles, okay? And it doesn't matter how you label your struggle. A few of you will label your struggle as addiction, but only a few of you, because nobody really likes to say they're addicted. How many of you enjoy saying you're addicted? Nobody does, right? It usually takes a long journey of realizing, I can't beat this, I'm addicted, most people won't call it addiction. They'll call their struggle a weakness or a character flaw or a bad habit. Regardless of what you call it, I want you to think about the struggle that you're engaged in or the struggle that you have been engaged in. And then you can see from the title of the message, most of us want to do the right thing. Not because someone else is telling us, but because of our own sense of right and wrong, the right and wrong meter inside of our hearts that tells us, not externally, but in our own set of conscience, I want to do better. I'll never forget one of my professors during my master's program coming in contact with this truth, and I've never forgotten it, which is what happens to most people over time is that they have strong convictions and rather than maintaining strong convictions over time, they compromise their convictions over time. And the reason we compromise over time is because we've tried hard to live up to our own expectations. We've tried to do the right thing. Most people I counsel with, especially people who come to church, they want to do good. They want to. They try hard, they do good, but they fail. Fall on their face. Try hard, do good, fail, and repeat for a while. And what happens is we fall into a ditch somewhere along the way and we give up. We stop struggling. We stop battling against the sin, against the addiction, against the struggle, against the bad habit, against the character flaw. We start to do one of two things. We're trying to walk this road of life, right? We try to walk this road of life and we either fall in the ditch of condemning ourselves because we think that's what God expects or we compromise, which is what's happening today in our larger culture, which I'll say this again because some of you need to hear it like all the time. We are far more likely to think like the culture around us than to think biblically. And where does the culture go. The culture doesn't fall in the condemnation ditch anymore, does it? It falls in the other side, the approved ditch. And the truth is, we don't need anybody outside of us to tell us this. Our hearts are more than capable of deceiving us. What most people fail to realize is that that little voice inside of you is broken. So we think ourselves into a whole, whole hill of problems and, and it has to do with pride and arrogance and thinking we're right. But what does Jeremiah say? What did the Lord say to Jeremiah? In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Your heart will lead you astray. So you do need somebody from beyond yourself, but it's not the culture around you. You need God. You need the Lord to guide you on this path, to go back to the road. You need the Lord to find that pathway through. But what is it? What is that pathway through? Well, it's the gospel. It's what we've been talking about. It's the truth of God that sets you free. And, and to put it succinctly, the gospel is good news, my friends. It tells me that although I am a sinner who falls short of God's standards and therefore deserves judgment, I am also loved so much that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to take my punishment and rise from the grave to give me the power to live a new life through the Holy Spirit. What happens to so many of us is that we deceive ourselves even though we think we're, th we're thinking biblically. We fall into a trap thinking this is how God thinks, so therefore this is how I need to apply it to my life. And that's what the study in the book of Romans is all about. And to set the stage is to reflect on the power of the gospel to change our lives. 
Many of you know I'm a huge fan of C.S. Lewis, and one of his quotes from Mere Christianity is, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. In other words, we're wasting our time. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. If it's only kind of important, why bother? But the truth is, the gospel changes lives. It changes lives. Changed my life. What do I mean by that? Well, my friends, you've heard me, if you listen to me preach through these years, say this many times. I am not what I was. I am not what I was. Someone said, thank goodness. I, I think you're talking about yourself, but <laughs> my wife would say, thank goodness, because wow. I'm not what I was. And, and one of the things that led me on the path to realizing I needed the gospel is because as a little boy, I grew up in an alcoholic home. And I watched my father, and I swore that I would not go down that road. And the irony is, some of you need to hear this this morning, the irony is you cannot produce positive results through a negative vow. And I learned that the hard way. Thank God I learned it early so that my bottom wasn't too deep. But in college, I saw that I was repeating all the same behaviors and walking down the same exact path. And I think it was a light from heaven that helped me realize I was going to end up in the same exact spot, train wrecking my life, train wrecking my career, and train wrecking whoever got close to me and became my family. And I didn't want that. Along came Jesus. I'm not what I was. And part of the good news was there's hope, but I also realize I'm not yet what I will be. I wanted transformation on day one to be complete. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work out that way. As most of you could see, I'm still a work in progress. I'm pretty good. <laughs> but boy, do I have a ways to go. Amen, baby? Yeah. Because even though I'm on my, I, I'm not yet what I will be, I am on my way. And this is the key that gets missed a lot of times when we fall into those ditches, either condemnation or approval. And it has to do with a lack of understanding a biblical concept called sanctification. Sanctification, my friends, is about patience in struggle and suffering. And how many of you know you live in the least patient place in the world? No, you live in the least patient place in the history of the world. If you got a problem, you take a pill. If you need information, forget even looking it up in a book anymore. Just ask Siri. If you need a sugar fix, there's a corner store everywhere you go. And so much more, amen? Amen. There's so many ways to mask our problems, to numb ourselves to pain and struggle so that we don't have to deal with life, to, to fall into the trap of thinking, I'll fix the problem and it will be okay. But those things only lead us into bondage. Spiritual and emotional bondage being far worse than the physical bondage we often experience. So what actually sets us free? It's this gospel thing. And the gospel teaches us that we need to be patient in God's work. I'm not what I was. I'm not yet what I will be. I'm on my way and God is at work. And, and one of the first steps for many of you is just admitting, I'm not a patient person. I want my problem to be solved like now. So, what do we do with it? Well, let's go to what where we've been in studying the Bible, what does it say? Back to that country road. What does it look like to walk the road of sanctification? What does it look like to walk this road I'm going to call self-acceptance or gospel self-acceptance? What is the green arrow forward? Whoa. What is the green arrow forward? How do I get there? Now, there's three possible approaches to it. They all seem godly, okay? Three possible godly approaches of walking that road, and, and two of them come from inside of us, and one of them comes from outside of us, okay? So, our nature battles against us because it's broken, 
And so we need to have God's guidance in this struggle. So let me demonstrate what I mean. I'm going to look at Romans chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. Listen to the word of God. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I can still vividly remember reading this the first time and coming to verse 15. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And I went, oh God, there's someone who knows. That's when I started with high standards. And I battled in my own power. That's what he's talking about. I battled in my own strength and my own power, hoping it would work, but all the while remaining isolated between my ears. That's what Paul's describing. Now notice what he says in verse 18. He says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. If you really pay attention to your struggles, like I said earlier, you will realize they don't come from outside of you, they come from inside of you. You, you finally get to a place where you can't blame anybody else. But how many of you have had so much joy blaming mom and dad? Anybody else? Woo, that worked for a while, didn't it? Eventually, we get to the point where we realize, listen, I did this to myself. I'm the one that put me where I'm at. And I start to realize as I become a student of my behavior that good itself does not dwell in me in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So what do I do? Do I give up? That's what, it, that's what it appears to be saying, but what Paul is really pointing us to the gospel. But let's focus on what he's not saying. The godly path he's not saying is this number one path that people take. It's called approach number one. I can fall into the self-condemnation ditch and condemn myself and or my behavior because we think that's what God expects of us. You know who's really likely to fall into the self-condemnation ditch? Good Christian people. Because they think that's what God expects. So if God feels that way about me, I should feel that way about myself. And so when we walk that road, we're walking that road and all we're doing is joining in and condemning ourselves. Let me tell you a secret. It's not God who condemns. It's Satan who condemns. And it's our broken nature that condemns. But it's not God. And when we battle, when we go through and we fall into that trap, we fall into what Dave, Pastor Dave was talking about a few weeks ago when he, when he did the study on Romans chapter three. We go, well, I'm not what I was and I'm not yet what I will be, but I'm dragging this baggage as I'm on my way. And because we're not trusting the gospel, we're being weighed down by this baggage. And one of the things that happens to us is we start to identify with the baggage, which is what we're going to talk about next week. And we start to actually believe, my baggage just doesn't weigh me down. But some of you can remember, repeat it with me. I am my baggage. That's not the good news of the Bible. It's, by the way, with all due respect to traditional 12-step programs, it's one of the reasons why I don't like how they teach you to introduce yourself at a traditional program, 12-step program. How do they teach you? They teach you to introduce yourself this way. Hi, I'm Greg, and AA, which I have familiarity with. Hi, I'm Greg, and I'm an alcoholic. No, I'm not. I am not my baggage. I might struggle with something, but I am not my baggage. I want to tell you, I'll let the secret out of the bag. I want to tell you who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. He tells me I'm a child of God, a new creation. He tells me I'm not my baggage. I'm not my brokenness. And I'm on my way to something better because I follow Jesus. Next week's sermon, you don't have to come. There you go, right there. <laughs> I'm not my baggage. Now, what happens, though, when people stay stuck between their ears? Well, they fall into the other ditch. Romans 6.1 talks about the other ditch. What shall we say then, my friends? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? What shall we say then? Shall we call sin good so that we can be proud of ourselves and say God approves of us? What shall we do, my friends? Shall we approve of ourselves so we don't have to feel bad? 
Read the first three words of verse 2 with me. By no means. Paul calls it a phony truth. In other words, if I go back to the ditch, falling into the approved ditch is no truth at all. It's no path to walk. Although many will think it, and like I said, it's kind of where our culture has gone. Our culture, and like, I, ha- I can't repeat this enough, we are far more likely to think like the culture than think biblically. So what we end up thinking is, well, the right path, path number two, approach number two must be, I could fall into the self-approval ditch and approve of myself and or my behavior. And because we're prideful enough and our hearts are wicked above all else, we will fool ourselves into thinking this must be what God thinks and we surround ourselves with people who confirm it. And and unfortunately, this, this is a far worse tragedy as I've discovered than the condemned culture. The approved culture causes more harm. Don't get me wrong, the condemned culture is bad. It's evil. But the approval culture is far worse. Why? Well, here's ancient truth for you. God told Jeremiah long before the days of Jesus, he said in Jeremiah 6, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? And another way to render it is this way, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. No amount of you saying it's okay makes it okay. It doesn't go away. Your own understanding and self-conception doesn't make it better. And quite frankly, it it provides a veil, a self-deception that actually makes it worse. Because open wounds, uncleaned, only lead to what? Infected wounds. And what happens to infected wounds, my friends? Well, if you leave them long enough, they get bloodborne. And when they get bloodborne, it's a matter of days until you die. We die spiritually, we die emotionally because we're in bondage to open wounds that we don't even acknowledge are there because we say it's okay. So we can't fall into the traps. Look again at the ditches. You can't fall into the condemned ditch. You can't fall into the approved ditch. So what do we do? Well, let's remind ourselves of a little bit of truth as we look at the right path. I already said this already. It's not God who condemns. Let's make sure we're grounded in that truth. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Read it with me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As you are on your way, as you receive Christ, trust me, God God comes and brings uh, conviction, tells us what we're doing is wrong, and invites us to believe in what is right. And when we receive Christ and we start to walk down that road, he doesn't condemn us because we continue to fail. That's crazy. You don't have what it takes to overcome. You need the one who has what it takes, who conquered death and gives life. There's no condemnation for us, those of us who are in Christ. So we've got to stop condemning ourselves too. Is that good news to anybody? You're not your baggage. You don't do yourself any favors by saying, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Like you're being self-righteous or something. No, you're not. That's dumb. That is dumb. It's based on what we talk about. You are more loved than you can imagine. Some of you thought I was going over the edge. I I think I would have fallen that way. I just got excited. Trust me, this truth has just been liberating. Yes, God hates sin and he hates the sin I commit, but I am more loved than I can possibly imagine. And he loved me before I started walking the right way. That's Romans 5.8. Read it with me if you would. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God. I'm a screw up. I continue to screw up. I continue to do the wrong thing. I continue to mess up. But God did something about it. That's the truth. So I better not call okay what God doesn't call okay. Because it's costly grace. It's not cheap. It's costly. Jesus paid the ultimate price, didn't he? So what is it? Here's the godly path, my friends. Number three, I can walk the road of self-acceptance knowing that I'm loved in spite of my struggles. And remember, I'm using the phrase gospel self-acceptance. Not self-acceptance as the world describes it. Self-acceptance according to the truth of God's word. You see, that's the pathway forward. Many of you have heard us talk about it before. This is why our motto is love, acceptance, and forgiveness. It describes the truth of transformation. The only way I can be transformed is if I learn to be patient with myself in my own suffering and struggle and not quit and not give up and not define myself by it. That's the pathway forward. That's what it looks like to live. But so many, because their minds are darkened, have so much trouble believing and understanding this truth. And like I said, all the way from the prophet Jeremiah to the teaching we find here in the book of Romans and also on the lips of Jesus himself. What is the story in John 8 about? It's about a woman, get this now, a woman caught in adultery. How many of you know you can't commit adultery by yourself? By definition, it, it means at least two. If she's caught in adultery, who else was there? But who do they drag in front of Jesus? Because they're hypocrite condemners. They drag this poor woman and they throw her down in front of Jesus and they say, she was caught in adultery. What are you going to do about it, Jesus? Jesus. What are you going to do? And Jesus starts drawing in the sand, and he's hanging out, and he's not flustered because he knows the heavenly way. And the heavenly way just led him to ask a simple question. He says, you know, why don't we do this? Why don't any of you who don't have a, any sin in your life, why don't you go ahead and be the first one to throw a stone? And the scripture says, one by one, from the oldest to the youngest. Why the oldest? Because the oldest know they're really messed up. <laughs> like, I might have been a dirty young man, but now I'm just a dirty old man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I need help no matter what age I'm in. It's not like I'm going to age out of my problems. Has anyone fallen in that ditch? So the oldest know themselves to be in the struggle if they're not living in denial. And one by one, they walk away until nobody's left. And what's it say then? It says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? I mean, he looks around. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. And read this next phrase with me. Then neither do I condemn you. The instant gratification culture is calling. <laughs> I need you now. Pick up your phone. I'm dealing with my struggle. Can you see it? So many of you think that God condemns you. It is not true. Satan condemns. Satan wants you to personalize that and feel bad, not about what you did, but who you are. Satan wants you to label yourself a hopeless sinner who's never going to get better and never rely on God. Some of you need to read that again when Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And some of you need to read past it. 
Because the approved culture that we live in, my friends, is a lie straight from the pit of hell. And I could probably say it stronger, but I thought that was pretty strong. Anybody else? (laughs) Read the last line. Jesus declared, read it with me. Go now and leave your life of sin. My friends, he says, I don't condemn. I don't approve. Go live an acceptance lifestyle. So what does it look like? What is gospel self-acceptance? It's actually not as hard as you think. The truth is, we get parts of this without anybody else having to tell us. And if you read the Bible, you already know it. But it doesn't mean you've put it together the right way or that you're focused on it. It's hard. Easy to say, hard to do. Why? Because it has us surrender our pride. It has us surrender our self-sufficiency. It has us surrender our isolation. It is humiliating to admit that we're broken. It can be. But when we practice and know that the one we humble ourselves in front of doesn't take advantage of it, but instead loves us and walks with us and gives us power to overcome, we realize it's the only pathway forward. So what is gospel self-acceptance? Number one, you have to call sin, sin. There's no way around it. You have to acknowledge the wound. And, And I'll just stick here. This should be good enough for most of you. We're not talking about what other people tell you is sin. You just ask what God thinks about what you're doing. And God loves you enough that he'll reveal it. And here's one of the things I learned about my journey in the midst of my struggle. There was plenty of things God dealt with me on right at the beginning of that journey. And I, I started to, you know, unload some of those things. And I started to go, wow, this is pretty awesome. And I thought, well, I must be okay now. And then God said, no, 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 no. There's a few more things we got to work on. So I keep myself open and humble. And when God convicts me, I call it what it is. But I I can still do calling sin, sin by myself. That's not gospel self-acceptance. Number two, I set up accountability that includes people who practice grace and will pray for and encourage. I look for people. Most of us know... I mean, come on, who wants to be around the condemner? Anybody? So most of us know we don't want to be around the condemner, but here's something you need to hear, by the way. Many, many of you are settling for the approver. Someone who's not gospel-centered, they're man's wisdom-centered. You need to find someone who practices gospel self-acceptance. And you need to walk with them. And you need to learn to tell the truth about yourself, to yourself, and to them. When I open myself up to the questions of godly people who love me and practice the gospel, it is like surgery to my soul. It's painful, it's hard, but you can't remove the infection without surgery. Do you know that a lot of times? And the scalpel of the gospel, though it bring pain, always brings healing after. Number three, when you stumble, confess to your accountability people. To people who love you, to people who won't condemn nor approve. Nobody who's going to find what your itching ears want to hear. And this next one is super important. Learn to ask for help before you stumble. If you start to actually look at your struggles and be a student of your own struggle, you'll start to realize you don't ever get to screwing up like, boom, where did that come from? Just go read the story of David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11. He didn't like suddenly sleep with Bathsheba. He didn't suddenly then kill Bathsheba's 
husband, there was like a series of like, I don't know, 30 steps until he got to the big problem. We call it cycling. And when you start to recognize that you're spinning up and cycling, you have to learn to have courage to ask for help on the front end of the cycle. This is where God invites you to practice grace for yourself and to invite accountability. And of course, number five, do it again. You have not yet suffered as much as you think you have, I'm almost directly quoting scripture right now, in your battle against sin. Call it what it is. That's what sets you free. Get people around you who practice this thing. And that's, my friends, what communion is all about. A lot of times when we share the communion story, we talk about Jesus offered his body and he shed his blood. We talk about it for the one day I'm going to be there, the hope of heaven. And that's totally appropriate. Jesus died and rose so that I can have the hope of eternal life. Very true. But Jesus died and rose also so that I could have hope in the midst of my struggles today. Jesus, communion is spiritual power, it's spiritual food. And I want to invite the band to come back as we prepare to take it. And as you take the bread and you take the cup today, remember, take your time. Remind yourself of what God has done. And some of you are like, you know what, I've been struggling and I don't see where God has worked at all. That's part of your deal this morning. Just take time to confess and look to Jesus for hope. And practice gospel self-acceptance. And as you come forward, be reminded of this truth. Jesus is the manna. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the food that helps us overcome. He not only promised that we'll be with him in heaven, he promised the Holy Spirit. And if you have confessed Christ, then the Holy Spirit is in you. Now it's time to let him do his thing. And that's what this whole invitation is for. If you need prayer, anything going on in your struggles, or you need healing, prayer, spiritual, emotional, physical, whatever, there's communion elements already over there in this room where our prayer team would love to pray with you and for you. There's always people available after the service. And today up in M1, our elders gather with our prayer team in response to the teaching of James 5 to be obedient, to pray for spiritual, emotional, and physical healing too. So if you want to come up after the service and be prayed over and anointed by our elders and our prayer team and our pastors, please come. We'd love to pray with you and for you. This is what Jesus offers. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the power to overcome. Thanks be to God. And all who agree say, amen. Amen. Lord God, come now and move in each heart. God, give us hope. Replace hope for the the condemnation that many of us are struggling with us. And Lord, replace the self-approval that we have with conviction to live a life of gospel self-acceptance. Come, Lord Jesus, set us free. Continue, Continue to do the work that only you can do in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.